So, welcome everybody and a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, this is a backup session, so if you um, expect that the person from Akamai, I'm sorry, I'm not that person. Um, but hopefully our talks will be pretty similar in what we are dealing with. Um, I've read the session description of the original talk, and it was about improving performance all across the step stack, and that's also what my presentation, four times high performance for Drupal step by step, is about. Uh, I'm Fabian Franz, aka Fabian X. I work for Techmans Consulting as a senior performance engineer, and I just got recently appointed to be a Drupal 7 core maintainer. So let's start. Four times high performance for Drupal step by step. Boom. Uh, uh, mo just a moment, just a moment. Uh, sorry, so no. Uh, what? The site slow? Um, I, I can't. I, I, it, look, I'm a Drupal con. I, I really can't fix the problem right now. Okay, just kidding. Um, but it happens to the best of you all. Um, your boss is calling right in the moment when you're holding a session. And there's a little thing. Um, this is a repeat session, but it was updated from LA when it was last shown. Um, so there, everybody will learn something, unless you're a PHP developer, then maybe not. But any PHP developer here? Okay. Um, so um, the last time I did that session, I also did that joke with the telephone. It turned out that if I hadn't had my telephone on flight mode, I would have indeed got a call kind of at exact that time, because the client had indeed a critical problem. So it was kind of funny. So your boss is calling. Um, it happens to the best of us, um, especially during DrupalCon, as explained, or during elections. The site goes down, the site is slow, grab a touch, and make it grow. Tutorial. But first, let's start with a little story. So, um, where's the power of Drupal? I hate Drupal. I hate Drupal, and it always overloads the database. Sometimes the load reached 200, and it never reached it before. I enabled core cache, and the server got down again the next day. Yeah, uh, it's a true story. Uh, there's a link; you can all follow it. Um, my site is so slow. Help! And I think it's a really, really sad story. And that was the one story that motivated me to say, "Hey." I'm going to want to speak about performance. I want to go show the community how everybody can have a performant and fast site, because I don't want that to happen anymore. And so there's a real need for high-performance Drupal. Faster sites earn more money. Faster sites get obviously ranked higher by Google. And in the original session descriptions, Akamai was even saying something like how to lose 900 million in four seconds or something like that. So. Obviously, there's a lot of things. Visitors love fast sites. I do, too. If I'm clicking on a site and I'm like, waiting, waiting. That's not a nice experience. Or you are finally mentioned in the media. Your product is really going off. Uh, you are everywhere. And then your site goes down. No one can see what you've brought to the world. Um, that's not good. That shouldn't be happening. But the question is, how do I get such a blazingly fast site? How do I do that? And let's start with some ways how do you could do it wrong. OK, I've now tweaked my sauerkraut settings, but the site is still slow. What sauerkraut settings do I need to tweak so that it's as fast as xyz.com? In this, And that's also almost literally a post from groups.drupal.org, because it happens that people are just trying to tweak something out of some part of the system um, without understanding. And I've set up t 10 slave DB servers, but once I test the site, it is still so slow. Why? So I'm uh, really knowledgeable. I've set up NGNX with advanced egg, varnish, combined with entity cache, and views row cache. Still, the performance remains the same. What am I doing wrong? Um, yeah, have you set up memcache? Has you considered that? Oh, what? <laughs> okay. Or the last thing. I've set up static page caching for all the pages. The high traffic day can come. So what could possibly go wrong? Everything. Because the site went down on that day. Um, 
actually that's also a true story and it was pretty scary because I was um, logging into the server as it was going down. It was like this movie feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you are logging into the server, your typing gets slower and slower and slower and you're trying to type Apache restart <laughs> and then it died. <laughs> So, and we come a little later, the reason for why that was, but Google Analytics was um, at fault because the page caching obviously caches per URL. So Google Analytics was happily from the big media campaign giving a unique URL to everything. So the static site caching in the end did exactly nothing. Uh, so we all wish very, very hard that we had the magic pill. Just one pill, edit, and the site is fast. But optimization is a process, not a pill. Because as, as we explained already, there's four common ways to fail. You could, for example, try to optimize one part to death by neglecting all the others. So if you build the house on one pillar, it'll not hold long. Or you could be optimizing things without knowing where the pain is. And I'll You want to hold an image to the wall. So you're putting it in the wall. And now you put a nail in it, and then it goes like this. But the problem is, you put another nail in here, and another, and another, and another, and it still goes like this, because that's not enough. You really need to put nails everywhere so that it will hold. And that's a good analogy. And there's also the thing that um, sometimes there's people who try to optimize things that already other people have tried and failed. Um, so um, everyone is like, hey, I have this great idea. We could just add this layer and this layer and that, and it will all work and it's nice and clean, etc." But others might have tried that way already and failed. And um, you might in the end even lose data with it because you didn't didn't understand the problem good enough. So there's a question of, do you want to reinvent the wheel or do you want to stand on the shoulder of guidance? And then obviously, you really need to law test. There's nowadays a lot of tools available, both proprietary and open source. Uh, we're not going into detail on that, but um, you'll find something with Google. And um, when you have a big site launch, ensure you are law testing your site. This is so crucial. And please don't just test the homepage, but test what you expect users to do. So what I've seen before is there was a shop, and they were law testing their page. Hey, everything is great. It will come. And then the customers were doing something really strange. They were actually buying and ordering things. So, um, but that path wasn't tested. So the server wasn't made for that lot in that case. So really you have to um, optimize the things and test it. Because when you are featured by big news com, your server goes down, that's not a good scenario. So just to recap that again, you could optimize one part to death. You could optimize just random parts without understanding the problem. You could just use the newest buzzword of the block and just optimize with that, like whatever is in, in vogue right now or you could optimize without testing. But uh, there are a lot of ways to fail. That is also complicated. <sighs> is there nothing I can do to make this easier and have a fast site? There's, here's the easy answer. Hire a performance consultant. Hire a performance consultant now. Call now in this second, 0800 Drupal performance and enjoy blazingly fast sites. Uh, so um, that's the end. So now, now performance is really difficult to get right, and that you should hire a performance consulting. Just remember that number. Uh, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> much. 5K for basic, 10K for advanced. Um, just kidding, you got me. Hiring a performance consultant can be really useful at times, but even more useful is learning and spreading the knowledge. Um, 
So, and that's where the step-by-step -step approach comes in. Let's walk the path of our ancestors and stand on the shoulder of giants. Your mission. Lording your mission. The mission. It's Drupal 7 8 side. It has several performance problems, real life problems. So let's meet some friends of mine. I'm very fond of them, so I hope you'll like them too. And let's help them in their need. There's D dot pages. And they feel slow and sluggish and really big in a way. Um, and they are totally unhappy. <sighs> this is so heavy, Lord. This is so much to bear. This is so, mm, just too much. And there's Mrs. Mays girl, and she is exhausted and needs a timeout. <sighs> I just need a select break. And Mr. Apache is sweating under all the load. I give 100% all the time, but this is just too much. And Mr. Code is buggy and a real troublemaker. Yeah. <laughs> so your mission is right there on the screen. The Drupal pages feel slow and are unhappy. Mrs. MySQL is exhausted and needs a timeout. Mr. Apache is sweating under the load. And Mr. Code is buggy and the troublemaker. So, your task, investigate and fix. Let's go. First is server performance. Measuring server performance. The system load is 4.14, the page load time is 20 seconds, and the Apache load is 100%. Who has experienced that? Ah, oh, there, oh, okay. <laughs> Even more than expected. Um, how to measure performance on server, and it's easy, and we're using that, it's top. You log into the server, you put in top, and you see the server load. It's that simple, and even though there's lots of advanced tools available nowadays, both proprietary open source, monitoring tools, reporting tools, but if you wanna know if the server is sweating under the PHP processes, and the problem I'll be explaining a little later, we actually debugged it with top, because with top we could directly see Oh, there's lots more load on the server without not much more requests. Then there's a little handy drush command for page generation time of any page. For those of you still using this Drupal 7, um, <laughs> just kidding, that will be still around for a while, so that's still handy. And um, But why would you do that? Why would you run a drush command in production? Because there's sometimes problems that show only up on production that you never see on your staging sites. And then you really need to log into production and um, you need to debug it on production. And then the simplest is to ensure that you're not kind of going into the flow or having to add lots of debug code that could affect your real users. What you're doing is you're doing that with Drush and you're just trying to get into the path and you're measuring it. And it's a very simple way and I've found problems with that already. Or for example, you have the little task of figuring out which cron job is slow. You know, cron is taking too long, it's timing out, you get errors, but which one is it? And then you just write a little drush command for yourself, and you say, um, for each module implements cron, uh, do that, and then you output it, and you start a little timer before and after, and then you can see exactly, uh, wow, it's Apache Solar that's taking too long, and the reason is a network problem, might be. So now we know that there is a problem or several. Um, how do we solve them? So the f four shoulders of the guides. Because while I have said that you always should be really, really, really working on your pain points first, just remember the paper. Yeah, or falling down. <laughs> There's a stack. And it's a performance stack that many, many high performance sites use. And that stack is press flow or in general just good code. Good code is so valuable for performance. Then there's APC and opcache, memcached or Redis, and some new kits, and one is NGX and a CGN. And, oh, oh PHP FPM, what are you doing here? I'm new here. So um, uh, before, I would say, um, Mod PHP, it was nice with you, but I think it's time uh, we all switch to PHP FPM. Uh, 
it had taken a long time until it was more stable. Better time has been reached now. Overall, we are seeing better performance with PHP FPM, and there's one advantage that is very, very important. With PHP FPM, and if everyone was there, we could rely much more on that, you can do work after the request has finished. For example, in Drupal 8, there's a pure man's cron if you don't configure any cron in your server. Um, which runs after a configurable while. And in Drupal 8, this happens after the request has been sent to the user. The nice and shiny L cache that we see later is also doing work after the request has been sent to the user. So all of that is happening. No user is affected. They have already their site and are happy, and we can still do work on the server. We can do many, many cool things. We can regenerate caches. We can do invalid caches out. But that only everything works really, really good for the user that they're really getting the document ready event and everything um, if you use PHP FPM. And uh, there's another one, Big Pipe and Streaming. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Big Pipe, you've already been handled yesterday. If you missed my talk yesterday about Stream Your Way to Success, it's online already. You can watch it um, or any of the other talks. Um, oh, there's another new one, and that's PHP 7. That's also new on the blog. We'll be talking about that in a moment. So how can those help me um, to get a fast site? Pressflow was only really relevant for Drupal 6 sites. Anyone still using Drupal 6? Huh two, three people, um, because Drupal 7 already includes most press flow patches and approaches, and as a Drupal 7 maintainer, I can tell you I'm more than happy to accept performance patches and getting those in, and uh, as long as they're in 8 first. That's our back policy, not to be discussed. And Drupal 8 has performance back tr best practices all around. So um, there's also something like an inofficial press flow, <laughs> like community-based by the groups of Drupal or high performance group. Um, there's like a wiki where all the collected performance patches that are relevant for Drupal 7 and have not been committed. I'm not so long a core maintainer, so wasn't really a chance to work on that yet. But in Drupal 8, all is committed already. I'm not aware of any patches that people are frequently applying to the distributions um, that are improving performance in a lot uh, that are not committed. So PHP 7, it's up to 50% faster. Sometimes people are seeing 60 to 70% faster. Drupal 8 supports PHP 7 since 8.0.0 out of the box. And Drupal 7, and I'm just going to say this now, supports PHP 7 really since 7.5.0. We have all our tests passing on PHP 7. There's one sorting issue where PHP 7 uses a stable sort and PHP 5 uses a different sorting and we are still figuring out how to do that, uh, but it's an edge case and it might happen on your sites, might not. It's just something to look out for if suddenly your comments are above your form, even though you had it differently, then you've probably run into that bug. But besides that, there's nothing in now. So really just start using it and start transforming your stack to it. Start with it, for example, in development, start developing sites, then put your test server, then your staging server, and then once you are happy and you see everything's working great, um, put it to production. PHP 5.6 uh, will be end of life just this year already, and the long time support, which means security fixes, will be to 2018. Um, so, is PHP 7 worth it? Seriously, it's really, really, really worth it. So this is admin performance um, on a Drupal 8 site. Uh, this image is um, from Josh Koenig from Pantheon, um, from whose blog post I've borrowed it. Um, but um, there's a source. So as you can see, we really are seeing like, um, you can literally see a 50% reduction in just the PHP time and database and um, Web external is the same in this example. And PHP 7, uh, with PHP 4 to 5, it was very slow. 5.5 until this was supported, that took a long time. But PHP 7, suddenly most hosters already support it because it's just that much better. And that's a little fun fact you might or might not know. Drupal 8, and especially my involvement in um, digging deeper and deeper, was the reason why PHP 7.0 release was delayed by two weeks. Because we found a critical bug in the garbage collector, which was happening under very 
but it happened in our test suite um, and then was fixed and the view had uh, one less bug in PHP 7 and a nice and shiny passing test suite on Drupal 8. Um, then there's APC. APC really is only important if you're using something you shouldn't be using, which is PHP 5.4 or God be there, 5.3 or 5.2. There's still an Ubuntu LTS version, which Drupal 7 technically depends on, where we say in Drupal 7 we still support 5.2 even as a PHP version. But if you're using one of those older versions, you really want an APC. But for everything new, you just want opcache. Um, it's really highly recommended. It's on by default since PHP 5.5. In PHP 7, it gets even more useful because it can persistently store all the loaded files on disk. So you have like a backing store. You never have the cold cache problems. And it speeds up the PHP execution by caching pre-compiled PHP objects. Because as PHP is interpreted, um, just parsing that all is different, but it, it directly stores the virtual machine code and just loads that, and that's just so much faster. So opcache, well, uh, you want to know, is it worth it? Should I really doing that? And yes, it is. It saves around, for a 500 millisecond request, it saves 100 milliseconds and it saves around 20 megabyte in memory. Because um, if you have to compile that everything, it's not only slow, um, but it's also expensive in memory. And in Drupal 8, you, you, you don't want that without opcache. <laughs> um, what can go wrong with opcache? And that's one of the things probably uh, almost no one knows yet. Um, opcache reset is buggy. Um, you might think you have your opcache and now you deploy something new and now you want to reset it so that you can ensure that everyone gets a fresh code. But if you call that or if it's called if your memory is exhausted or your key namespace, um, then there's a little bug um, because opcache is actually disab um, is d disabled when you call that if it runs into a race condition. The reason is pretty simple. In PHP there was some, some co uh, there was something that wanted to lock a warning message that it had to kill some of the processes that were still using an opcache lock. Uh, and unfortunately, they used an error and the error was bailing out, so it permanently got stuck in that state. And if you then didn't restart PHP FPM or mod PHP, then your opcache would permanently be broken. And that actually happened to us. And But also opcache with that be aware of once you are um, restarting it, it gets disabled. And that can take up to two minutes. Um, it's configurable, but the default is two minutes. So for two minutes, your site is running without opcache. And that could put a huge spike on it. So just be aware. And um, so size it properly, because if it's full, it will automatically trigger a restart. Oh yeah, and all released PHP versions are buggy, but the next outcoming PHP 5, 6, and 7 will have some fixes. Um, you can use a PHP FPM graceful restart, and there's a blog post coming up at Tech One Consulting com by one of our infrastructure engineers how to do that really cleverly with systemd. Um, so look at the stats. Upcache going offline can lead to huge strikes. That's a real side that really happened last week. Because why we had the fix in p the newer PHP version, we couldn't run it obviously because Fedora hasn't released it yet. Um, so we were gracefully restarting PHP FPM, but there, Upcache ran out of memory due to various reasons. And even before it was already not running as nice, but then there was this huge spike <laughs> when it ran out of memory and opcache was completely disabled until um, the alerting system caught up and we got a, um, a notification and we immediately restarted PHP FPM and um, then the site was, slowing, um, was going smooth again. So um, really be aware of that. Um, then there's memcache redis. Um, it replaces the caching in the MySQL database. It's a key value store in main memory. It needs a daemon installed, so there's additional infrastructure. It's very fast. Um, so what does it get you? Um, it's way less load on the database. Um, there's overall faster caches. Um, and 
load in the database for caches can be problematic, uh, especially for one reason, um, because um, you can ha get a query contention at the beginning because it tries to cache all those cache things and when you frequently write and read, um, then it can lock other things out. And um, Memcache is pretty simple to scale out because you have a distributed key value storage. In Redis, you have like a replication model, which is isn't as simple. There's also a proxy, which you can use to do something similar to what Memcache does. But there's a new kid on the block. Who has seen the Lcache presentation? Okay, few people, but not everyone. Um, there is a new uh, module called Lcache. It a, uses a key value store within PHP. Are called APCU, um, which you get automatically if you use APC for PHP 5, 6, and 7. You have to install the extension, but it's well supported. It's kind of done by um, PHP maintainers themselves, so it's um, good support, less bugs, and used by Drupal 8 also out of the box if it's available. That's even faster than Memcache. Um, it's very simple. It just have a transaction log and a consistent store in one. But the big advantage is you don't need an additional service. So if you don't have a lot of infrastructure guys that can set up memcache or whatever, you don't need the extension that for PHP 7 isn't even stable already uh, yet. Um, and for Redis, you have something stable, but then you have to configure Redis, and then you have to deal with failover. And if it's on another box, you might saturate the network um, or another container, uh, so that's a Little problem, but with Lcache, you just need the database and APCU. And uh, presentation of that is online already. I highly recommend it, even if it's advanced level. Um, if you just flip through the slides or go through that, that's something really cool coming up. There's also the super cache module. It's similar to Lcache and the chain fast that's in core. It's especially optimized for write performance and cache tags, but it might have race conditions. And then there's Warnish. Um, one is, is really like a shield for your web server. It's crucial for high throughput of anonymous traffic and hopefully soon authenticate traffic. Um, working hard on that, you serve the response just from memory and it's like, here's your Apache and the shield thing works like this. You have like thousands of requests coming in and then and they are all for the homepage. And there's a cache miss, so the homepage is not yet in the cache. So. But one is just sending one request to the backend, getting the homepage back, and then all of those thousands get the homepage and all requests afterwards directly get served by Varnish. So even though that is an additional daemon, um, very, very highly recommend if that's not part of your stack or NGNX caching, um, add it, it's so worth it, much more worth it than um, Apache and static files and that. It sounds pretty complicated. Actually, it was in the days of Drupal 6, in the days of Drupal 7 and 8. It's really just, um, you use best practice configuration, either from Lullabot or for Kitchens. We should upload our own soon, too. Um, you plug that into your Varnish, and you're good to go. Varnish 5 has been recently released. I'm not sure, but there shouldn't be many changes in that, so might need some little tweaking, but I'm sure someone will soon upload one for five too. So what does it get you? It gets you really, really fast response times. And um, coming a little later to that, but if you can't set up Varnish, there's an easier solution for you. You can, for example, use Fastly um, or Cloudflare or other CDNs and just put your whole site behind the CDN. That's kind of where most of the things are moving to that we are going away from localized Varnish configurations, but to globalized by, for example, using Fastly, um, where you can also upload your custom VCL on request and do lots of cool and interesting things. And that's less for the beginners that are here, but um, <laughs> maybe your staff um, might have some interesting ideas of how to um, use that. So um, that's another possibility if you can't install Varnish, at least ensure you're using a good CDN, which is not just caching your static assets, which was kind of the best practice before, but really everything of your site. Your mission, update. The anonymous pages. We are blazingly fast, still big, but quite happy. This is my SQL. Well, I have less to do now. 
but if I have, it is still too much, especially those authenticated users. Mr. Apache, I have much less to do, but when those authenticated users come, I still sweat, and I hate those anonymous UTM requests. So that would be the quick fix for the Google Analytics problem. Um, um, you just strip it out. There's a little catch with that. If your site is doing a redirect, um, you are actually losing information with that. Um, what you can, however, do, I just recently learned that, is um, you can kind of put it into a special variable in the request header, and then if you get back a redirect response like a 302, 301, you just put it back <laughs> into the URL. So it is a little tricky, but it's the only way to properly support that. And um, I really highly recommend adding that to any of the best practice VCLs because, uh, and most bigger hosters like Pantheon already have something like that um, because um, as it's just, um, it can bring your site down because all that varnish caching, all those things is just for nothing. So even if you're using Fastly, you definitely would want a rule like that in there. The alternative is, and that won't work with redirect either, to configure Google Analytics to just send pound instead of with a question mark. So, um, but then if you have a redirect, it also gets lost. So client performance, measuring client performance. You have a page load size of 300 kilobyte, page load time of 20 seconds. How do you measure performance on the client? The easiest is you use the Google Chrome developer toolbar. There's a network tab. And if you install the page speed extension, also page speed tab, that will give you lots of information. Then there's webpagetest.org, which for every performance audit, I, had, I um, suggest to at least use once. That means once for the home page, once for the most important node pages, et cetera, and ensure that your waterfall is looking good. If you're interested, there's currently a very interesting survey on webpagetest.org you can participate in, um, where you can look at the perceived performance of pages and can see which one is faster. It's a fun little thing to do, and you get an idea of how it feels when you have to wait for things. Webpagetest.org is also giving you a video for your own site of how it would look for a user that hasn't loaded that before. So it's pretty cool and standard in that. So, but why are those pages so big? You need to compression of CSS and JavaScript. And that's very easy to set up. Um, in Drupal 7 core, you still have to do that manually. In Drupal 8 core, it's enabled by default. And you really need to check that before go live because your users will thank you for it. Uh, you need mode free write and mode headers for that to work properly in Drupal 7 and 8. It can also be done in Apache with, for example, mod deflate, but it could put lo high load on your server because it needs to compress everything, so you really want to combine that with Varnish then. Then we obviously want to minimize your CSS and JavaScript source files. Um, and then there's the advanced egg module for Drupal 7 and probably Drupal 8 in beta now. Um, there's way less aggregates for that really nice module, but we had some clients we couldn't use it on because it had side effects. There's alternatives to advanced egg. That's agri-cache, um, which hopefully goes into core for Drupal 8. There's the node, so if anyone is a Drupal 8 developer, um, that's the node to help on with. And then there's the simple aggregation module, and you know it happens. Um, I've seen so many modules, and then one of our front-end developers came along and said, hey, I've already written this module since three years, John Alban in this case. Simple aggregation was like, never heard of it, and like, wow, it's pretty cool, because it's a very low-risk module to reduce your aggregates from, I think we had 12 on the page, and then it was four. Um, and combined with aggregash, you can also improve the performance, so they are not mutually exclusive, but can be combined. You also want to set proper caching header, and fortunately, uh, Drupal 7 and 8, just setting those headers for you already, you just need to adjust the numbers if you want. Unless you use Akamai. In that case, um, you really want to set some edge control headers. Um, so what did we achieve so far? We have only four HTTP requests, much faster page load time, 
your mission update. In Emmanuel's pages, we are blazingly fast, really slick, and really, really happy. Really, really happy. So additional techniques is to use a content delivery network. It caches files close to the user's location. There are challenges, but that's in other talks of if you want to do that with China. It's useful for images, JavaScript, CSS files. So CDN module just got released. Um, the new, um, the I think either beta or a C version of a CDN module for Drupal 8, for Drupal 7, it's stable for ages. It's a no-brainer to put it on. You can use it together with, for example, AWS, um, and it just works. And as I said before, Fastly Cloud 4, uh, put your whole site behind CDN and with Drupal 8, and that's in other talks of me and Wim, if you want to know more, it's nicely integrated with a cache tag system of Drupal 8. Then there's Ajax PJAX that you can use for pages and image galleries, but it needs configuration for Drupal 7. And for Drupal 8, there's Refreshless. It only reloads the content you need, but it works out of the box. Little quick tip how to fix slow JavaScript. Um, if you have like an unresponsive script error on loading of the page, there's a very quick workaround you can do. Just wrap the code in a set timeout um, and do it after the page has loaded, the user is happy, especially if it's non-critical. Module performance. Measuring module performance. For example, in our sample, the bootstrap would take 240 milliseconds, but um, now for Drupal 7, the menu active, active handler would take six seconds. The memory usage would be really high. You really want to find out how that's happening. And um, how would you measure such module performance? You would use the XHProf PHP extension. Integration, for example, via XHProf module or via my own um, uh, GitHub module. Okay. Keynote likes to do it. I'm going to real quick go into an XHProf um, that you know how that looks. Um, this is on Drupal 8. Um, and there's obviously a performance problem because it takes seven seconds. Um, memory is okay, pretty much. So we are taking a look and you can obviously start here and you can go in and in and in and in and in and in. And we're probably still being tomorrow here. So uh, that's not what we're gonna do, but we wanna take a look at the numbers and slowly going down. And here's a huge gap. And now we take a look at whether it is. Oh, a developer has forgot to sleep six in there. Uh, <laughs> happens all the time. Um, actually, it happened to me when I was preparing something because I wanted to show a really cool demo and needed something to be slow and then I forgot it and was trying another screencast was like, why is that side so slow? What happened to it? <laughs> so yeah, it can happen. Um, if you need to run it on production and you are, for example, allowed to install the XHProf, extension, but you're not allowed to enable XHProf module or do something else, and you really don't want to have XHProf enabled all the time, uh, there's a little kit I've wrote which is called XHProf kit. And you just download it um, and um, install it, and then you have like a index perf.php, and you do just like well equals slash user2, and then loads that URL for you. Yeah, and we'll see the sleep is still there, so we have to take a uh, wait six seconds. And then at the bottom, here's our profiler output, and then we got a new um, profile thing. This is very, very helpful for production deployment because often adding a little script is okay, but really changing database module installation is not, especially because it could make performance problems go worse or by clearing all the caches, it could also make a performance problem you were trying to debug away. So you look at it <laughs> and it's, uh, it's gone. So this is a very unobtrusive way to do that and it's called um, XHProfKit. And it's easier to ever than ever to use with Drupal 8 because before you need to set up something and now you just install it, call the setup function and then it works. So let's restart Keynote, which really didn't like um, me going to that thing. <laughs> and find where we have been. So around 
see our model performance. Yep. Okay, that's where we have been. Good. Let's play again. So uh, for Drupal 8, you can use a web profiler module. For Drupal 7, there's a very handy newly released block timer module. And if you want to get really, really, truly awesome insights into your caches, there's a Heisen cache module, which provides you a full framework of getting all the information of, of what your caches are doing. Then there are some common pitfalls, variables set on each page request, and it can bring your DB server to its knees. I've seen that happen on a very, very big and important site in production. Um, and features was to blame in the end because um, we disabled the module that was doing the variable set and then features was somehow triggering a rebuild and the module was back. <laughs> and so suddenly it happened again because that module was doing a variable set and hook in it and that's something you really shouldn't be doing. If you want to bring a site down, that's somehow the simplest way. Um, so generally, try to avoid writes during page request because every write is something the database cannot scale, you cannot push it, it really needs to go to the master database. Um, it can bring your DB server to its knees, even if you say, oh, this one little write of counting the node statistics, that won't hurt, it will. Um, because in the end, if it happens one time, not a big deal, if it happens a hundred times, it can be a very big deal. Then obviously anonymous session set for saving simple data, like if you have a low benefit flag or you have um, like a country specific saying or whatever, which is really just needed for, for the front end, don't put it in session, use proper cookies instead. Um, ensure that those cookies are readable by the JavaScript, T try to do AJAX requests for it, really avoid opening sessions as much as possible because it, it disables all your anonymous caching. If you have a shopping cart, you probably need a session, but even there you can have things like um, ignore that session for most pages and just have it on the cart and then have a little counter that's just the amount of products the user has added and you still have page cache working, counter is read by JavaScript and all pages are nice and clean and shiny and the card is the current card content. So there's lots of things to optimize that. <laughs> Having installed way too many modules, um, Drupal 6, it was the worst in Drupal 8, is no longer that much a problem. Drupal 8, we just have a little too many classes maybe. Um, then there's a uh, little story for views and open layers um, that could exceed your memory. There's a little module for that. Um, then you use block caching, render caching, like my render cache module, uh, to improve the performance. There's a cool core patch coming up. I forgot to put the note in here, um, but um, explore how to backport the render caching system of Drupal 8 to Drupal 7 as the title. And um, it makes block cache automatically work out of the box with all assets, Drupal 8, JS, CS, whatever. No more problems can be just enabled. It will hopefully, 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 if you all come to Wend on Friday and fix that issue for me, uh, be in 751. Um, use a block cache alter module. Um, then you can configure for every block how it should be cached set up views caching, set up panels caching, set up displays view caching. Click those checkbox and see what is acceptable for your users. Sometimes 10 minutes is acceptable that your content is not okay. Sometimes six hours is. And that can make a huge, huge difference in that. Sometimes you say, I w just views has a very nice thing where you have an output and results cache, which was broken but is fixed now. Um, so you need to use the dev version of the newest views. Um, you can set up something where you are looking at views and you say, um, I want to cache the output for just a short time, like 10 minutes, but um, sorry, I want to cache the output for six hours, but if my results change from the database, uh, then I want to get fresh results. And um, that's a very nice combination of that because the output is actually depending on the results returned. So if there's something new coming to the list, that just works. Dynamic page cache, it's enabled out of the box, but ensure it's effective. I've seen a site that still had 700 milliseconds even though dynamic page cache was enabled. Use a placeholder for your dynamic things that are making that impossible, especially if it's in the main content. 
um, Drupal 7 Auscache, it needs to be configured, but it's much easier to use now, but don't split it too much. Had a site with 11 AJAX requests every time it brought it down. It was using AJAX even for blocks that could have been perfectly cached with a page. So really, really only do it for the dynamic parts. Um, so we found the bad code, removed it, the page is much faster now. Your mission, update. Mrs. MySQL, she's almost happy, she feels still kind of slow sometimes. The Apache is happy, the d.pages is happy, so that's cool. Database performance, measuring the MySQL performance. Slow SQL theory, it takes 10 seconds, also recently happened to me. Use per corners, MySQL slow query log analyzer, you'll find the problems much faster that way. Um, we had a problem on the side, real production side, big client, um, and um, there was this MySQL problem, slow query, and we didn't know why it was slow. I got the slow query log from the server, ran this little tool on it, and immediately showed me this is a problem. I was really just, literally in seconds, I could see it's missing an index. It was originally forgotten in the build because there was a new query added later after it was originally built, and then this was not taken care of. I added the index and it was fast ever since. Enable the slow query log in your database for six, and I'm just having that on the slide because I'm still hoping there will be a six, seven or eight version was a DB tuner module. There's a MySQL tuner script for 7x and explain your queries. If you're using proprietary tools like New Relic or whatever, you also always have your queries there and you can directly get an explanation of what's happening. And if you see something like creating temporary tables or um, no indexes used, um, that's a bad flag. Common tweaks, use InnoDB, be aware of the barrier, mind the barrier. Um, you need to use no barrier equals one for X3, X4 and file systems. Because on newer Linux kernels, Ubuntu, that's enabled by default and it's zero, uh, so the barrier's on and your MySQL performance will just be so bad. I, it happened to me and I was like, why is my MySQL so slow? And then I researched and I found that. Just be aware, mm, it needs to be used with a special hardware for production usage so you don't lose data. Useful guides in Red Hat Handbook. Easier is to use XFS file system or ZFS, good and proven files for MySQL database, has snapshot functionality size appropriately to the use case. Explain those queries, add the indexes where necessary, you will see what the query is doing. Ensure you have the right order, um, so um, that it's going from highest to lowest, and then run the explain again and see if it's doing the right thing. So, what did we achieve? No more slow queries, yeah! Um, your mission update. Commercials. Oh, you know, this Drupal thing, it's really cool. It now has even more outside in in it. And the new block placement UI is really cool. And I heard it makes really good hair. Oh, I really need to get that. Okay. Uh, best practices. You set up the base performance. You want to have your own high performance stack. If you want to do hosting yourself, you want to have your own high performance stack. It's not as difficult as you have seen. You need to analyze the pain points first if you're doing performance auditing. Where's the problem? Is it server-based? Is it client-based? Is it the modules? Is it the database? Optimize those pain points. Your mission, update. Mrs. MySQL is happy. Apache is really happy. D.Page is really happy. Wake up, Neo, mission completed. Questions? Please use the microphone. Hi, um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned uh, obviously Varnish and, and Memcache. Um, what tools would you recommend, if any, to uh, see what's happening with the memcache, for example? What is cached? What is being cached at the moment? And uh, uh, when you have uh, a distributed uh, architecture, how to make sure that everything is clear from, from memcache to, to have a fresh uh, start? Um, okay. So, um, 
There were several questions at once. <laughs> no problem. So the first thing is um, you want to, and um, what tools to recommend? For Varnish, there's Varnish NCSA command line tool where you can just live look at the traffic. It's using shared memory. It's <coughs> unobtrusive to Varnish and it's you just use it. Needs a little, there's tutorials on the net to just see. And then there's Varnish top where you can see a histogram of what's happening on your site. Um, for memcache, there's memcache.php script you could be using. You talk about remote memcache instance and that's a problem. TechOne has been maintaining a remote memcache um, thing for years now um, where we were actually synchronizing two memcache instances across two data centers. But while it worked, um, you can contact us, we still have the patch and but we never kind of pushed it to the real memcache module because it was not that much demand. I would probably go um, with Alcache in that case because that solves your problem um, already and then you obviously already have some setup for uh, MySQL to do the replication and ensure the consistency there. And that would solve your problem because then you have one problem less, just a database to care with and there's a solution for that. Next question, please. Uh, hello. Um, when you were talking about the uh, aggregation of like JavaScript files, CSS files, things like that, um, with Drupal 8's library management and dependencies where it only adds it to the page when it needs to, is that something we should just turn on and just let aggregation do its thing or should we worry about the granularity and when things get aggregated and when they don't? Um, in general, in Drupal 8, it should just work with the library system. Um, but the real problem is we are generating those assets. Um, we are making one user suffer for it. And those users' page requests will be slow while we generate it. So that's why the core issue is going into a direction of way more of what other systems are doing. We're going to a standard Gmail way like that we're doing include those libraries, exclude those, those are already loaded. And then uh, just loading the assets and in aggregate base is just slash JS, include that libraries and we're done. So um, that's the direction we are going. In general, Drupal 8 should be doing a better job of, of setting up the groups and everything because we've worked hard on improving that performance part as well. Next question, please. Hi. <laughs> um, is va uh, Varnish bad to use with um, forms on the page? Like a Drupal form? W with what? The varnish. Uh, with a Drupal farm. You mean you have a Drupal farm and then you have a varnish. So, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> the thing is, um, uh, obviously, you have to have some kind of expiration in your varnish. So, um, in Drupal 8, the expiration would be working via cache tags. In that case, you would be sending the invalidation request to all varnish. But usually, you don't have a varnish per web hat, but you have one central varnish, which is usually also um, being a load balancer to the web heads itself and using a director pattern for doing so, health checks to put out things that are not working like that. And then for highly redundant varnish, you would just use a standard heartbeat pattern with one machine and static IP file over. Hello. Uh, is there a chance that uh, Drupal 8 uh, will have eventually Memcache in core or Redis? Because right now it has an APC uh, U uh, caching backend, right? Which is not actually in memory. Or if it is, uh, it's just only per request. Yeah. So APC U at the moment is um, not just per request, but it's just enabled for certain things like cache collectors and things that are very not much written. Um, but instead much read. Um, the more likely scenario is that um, instead of memcache or Redis going into core directly, is um, that either someone writes an adapter to directly write via PSR6, 
So then you would have all of those things automatically. Uh, we have a caching layer of PSR6. Um, the other possibility that um, is also very likely that in H3 uh, H3X or H4X, Lcache will be the standard caching solution. Because even if you don't have APCU uh, and use PHP FPM, the model of inserting and deleting at the end of request is faster um, than the current model core, core uses, than the absurd we are currently using and for Drupal 7. And while it's an alpha, um, I will try it out and I also would say just try it out if it works for you because it's a really cool solution. Pantheon just started um, putting production sites for it, out for it. Two are launched by now, I think. And um, they've not seen any data errors in weeks, so um, it's really more likely we'll be going the Lcache route. Because, yeah, and maybe a PSR6 adapter. Uh, next question, please. Uh, if there's no more questions, then um, some more advertising. Join us for the contribution sprints on Friday. Um, there will be a first time sprinter workshop from 9 to 12 in room Wicklow 2A. And um, in, this in this room will be the general sprints. Um, have fun with Drupal and please, please, please evaluate my session. Feedback is so valuable and I really want to improve and I really want to give you a good time and I hope you all had a good time with the session. Mm -hmm.